Greetings and welcome to another broadcast, another teaching uh, of a Heart After God Bible teaching ministry. And I am Brad Abley, and it's my pleasure and privilege before God to take you through His Word, specifically through the parables of Jesus. And um, my heart is that believers would would not be intimidated by the parables of Jesus, that believers would not, uh, that they would be trained, that you would be trained in in sound principles of interpretation in the parables of Jesus, which one third, about one third of all of his teaching was done in parables. So that's a significant amount. I love the parables of Jesus and I love teaching them, but most of all, my responsibility before the Lord and to you is to teach them accurately. And that is my goal in all these parables. If you have your Bible, please open it to Matthew chapter 13. And we are going to read, we are going to be treated uh, in this broadcast to an incredibly important parable. And that is the parable of the wheat and the tares, which comes immediately after the parable of the sower. And so Matthew chapter 13 and verse 24, we're going to read that in just a moment. Often, parables are are misinterpreted and they are misunderstood and even avoided and so again I want to emphasize that what we're trying to accomplish in this teaching is 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 to learn to be confident in in interpreting the parables of Jesus and certainly uh, to to break through misunderstanding and and misinterpretation of it now uh, I'm really teaching two groups of people. Number one, the, the original reason for these broadcasts uh, are to teach year-round uh, the pastors and church leaders that, that I have a ministry to in Siaya, Kenya. I have, since 2014, January of 2014, I've been there six times, and I'm training along with my best friend from seminary days, Danny Gilbert. We are training... Uh, upwards of 90 uh, pastors uh, twice a year in sound principles of interpretation. Really, we're bringing seminary to those that can't afford to go. And so we're teaching them sound principles of interpretation, um, sound principles of Bible study. We're also doing a lot of pastoral uh, training, pastoral leadership, and and um, answering a lot of questions. And we just enjoy... Uh, our brothers and sisters in Siaya, Kenya. And so for those of you in Siaya who are watching, I say opak ruof to all of you and nyasai ogwedu. And that is uh, for those of you who don't speak luo, I'm just saying praise the Lord and then I'm saying God bless you. The other audience that I'm trying to reach is you. Those of you who are, are watching um, here in the United States or anywhere in the world, I'm really targeting this broadcast for those who are really hungry for God's Word. They they want to go deeper in God's Word and they want to learn the more difficult aspects uh, or parts of God's Word. And so that really is a, that's my second audience. And um, as a matter of fact, I actually just got back from Kenya only two weeks ago and I promised uh, the pastors and leaders there that I would do more video teaching and that's what I'm doing and um, so we're about to go into God's Word in depth would you join me in prayer as we trust the Holy Spirit now uh, Heavenly Father we thank you for your presence with us we thank you that you have drawn us uh, to study your word and we invite you our teacher Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us into all the truth now. We pray that you would change us and transform us to be more like you, Lord Jesus, for the glory of the Father and of the Son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. By the way, that's a prayer that I I pray somewhat along those lines before I ever open up God's Word. It's just a simple rule. It's a life-giving rule for me, um, but I don't ever want to open God's Word without first praying because in the praying, I'm, I'm really showing 
God that I am totally dependent upon him, particularly God the Holy Spirit, whose role it is within the Godhead uh, to, to lead me and guide me into all the truth. And so that's why I pray the way that I pray. Now, let's go to uh, uh, Matthew chapter 13 and just a quick overview. Matthew 13, verse 24 and forward, the parable of the, um, the wheat and the tares is going to explain to us why God allows the wicked, why God doesn't deal with the wicked now. And um, it's also going to talk to us about the coming judgment. It's going to talk to us about an eternity in heaven and an eternity in hell. And um, so those are just a few things that you can expect that we're going to go through. All right, so let's go to Matthew chapter 13 and verse 24. Jesus presented or laid before another parable to them. And them is his disciples um, and the multitudes. And this, this is this, at the same time, apparently, that he teaches uh, the parable of the sower. That is, this is the next parable. Because in Matthew 13, verse 1, we find that day Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea. Um, this is referring to his home in Capernaum, which was his really... Um, his headquarters, if you will, throughout his entire uh, three and a half year ministry. And most of that time was spent ministering around the Sea of Galilee. And that would be his Galilean ministry. And so I've been to the, to the house in Capernaum that Jesus stayed in. It was actually Peter's house. And um, you can walk from this house to the shore of the Sea of Galilee, I think in about a minute. So Jesus had a pretty nice place to teach in. The Sea of Galilee is beautiful when it's not stormy. And most likely that, that area is where he taught in. And so he teaches the parable of the sore first. And then right after finishing that parable, he launches into this next parable. So there's a little bit of the background for us. Again, verse 24, Jesus presented another parable to them the crowds and the disciples, that's important to keep in mind, saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. The word, Greek, the word in Greek for good is, is good, beautiful, attractive, winsome. So that's the idea of the, of the seed that is being sowed here. But, verse 25 while his men were sleeping, so um, of course this 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 sower would be a master, uh, did this work through his through his servants. But while his his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. Sowed tares among the wheat and went away. These are uh, these are poisonous plants, if you will, that that as the wheat is young and growing, the tares grow up with that wheat and, and it's virtually indis um, you can't distinguish between this poisonous plant that grows up with the wheat. And so uh, this enemy is clearly very clever. He is very malevolent. He is wicked to the core. Now, verse 26, But when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. The slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? They are astonished. How in the world could this have happened? They certainly didn't do this. And he, the landowner, said to them, An enemy has done this. And the slaves said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? Verse 29, But he said, No. For while you are gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. Allow, verse 30, both to grow together until the harvest. 
And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather up the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them up. But gather the wheat into my barn. Well, Jesus finishes that parable and he proceeds to give two more parables, very brief parables, the parable of the mustard seed, only two verses, in verses 31 and 32, and then another parable, the parable of the yeast, in verse 33. And then Matthew gives a, a brief explanation about Jesus teaching only in parables at this point in verses 34 and 35. Well, that brings us to verse 36. This is when we are going to find the explanation to the to the parable of the wheat and the tares because there is no explanation. Jesus doesn't give us any interpretation or explanation in verses 24 through 30. But what we're about to find is quite surprising in verse 36. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. So he leaves the Sea of Galilee and walks back into the house. Again, it, it, not more than, than a minute's walk. And, and his disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. The reason why I'm, I'm being emphatic in saying that is the Greek word explain is an urgent, um, it's really a demand. It, it, in the Greek, it's an imperative. That is, it's, it's a command. <laughs> the disciples are commanding Jesus. This is significant because it is extremely rare in any of the Gospels that anyone ever commands Jesus to do anything. And the Greek word means to make thoroughly clear right now. Make it thoroughly clear right now. The urgency of the question shows how much this parable shook the disciples. And we can understand because in we can understand why. Because in, in the parable of the sower, verses 1 through 23, Jesus explains that the nature of the kingdom is such that it can grow exponentially, even with explosive growth, by those who really hear the word of God and grow by it. And so this really set an expectation in the hearts of the disciples uh, for an expansive growth of the kingdom. Well, Jesus reinforces that in the parable of the mustard seed and in the parable of the yeast. But now they are absolutely perplexed and stupefied, if you will, about this parable of the weeds. How in the world could, could this happen? I think at this point they understood who the sower was, and that is Jesus. And they're, they're shaken. They, they want to know why Jesus would allow this. At some level they understand it, but they need further understanding. There's another thing that we want to notice from verse 36 is that, and that is that the crowds were nowhere to be found again for the second time. Back in, in verse 10 of Matthew 13, only the disciples came and asked Jesus for an explanation. Um, Matthew doesn't say that specifically, but the same parable uh, either in Mark 4 or Luke 8 uh, tells us that they came to him for an explanation. So two times, with with an extremely important parable, the crowds never even ask him for an explanation. And and if you've watched uh, some of my previous teachings on the parable of the sower, it was expected that people, especially for a great rabbi, would would want to they would ask for an explanation of the parable. They understood that a parable was given to hide God's truths from the disinterested or the casual observer and explain them to someone who was really hungry to know more about his word. And the Jewish people highly respected the word of God. So this is another perplexing moment that the crowds don't ask. And so, so, 
So they say to him, explain to us. They are demanding to Jesus, explain to us the parable. And it's interesting that they say of the tares of the field. It's almost like they completely disregard or ignore the good aspects of, of this parable. You know, the, the good seed being sown and all that. In other words, they're focusing on the negative part of the parable. And that's understandable. I think if I were those disciples, that's probably where I would gravitate to as well. Well, let's go to verse 37. So uh, Matthew tells us in verse 37, And he, Jesus, said, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. And the field is the world. It is not the church. It's important for us to understand it. It's the world. And as for the good seed, remember, good is, is good, pleasing, beautiful, attractive, winsome. That's the nature of the Word of God. He says, as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom. That is, that's what the, the Word of God has produced. The sons of the kingdom and the tares are the sons of the evil one. Verse 39, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil and the harvest is is the end of the age. So he's now getting into teaching about last things. Verse 40, So just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. I forgot to mention, I knew I was getting something back in 39, verse 39. The enemy who sowed them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are are um, angels. I forgot to mention that part, but you probably caught that. Anyway, back to verse 40. So just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom. Isn't that interesting? that Jesus is referring to the kingdom of God as his kingdom as well. And he will gather out of his, they will gather out of his kingdom, all stumbling blocks. The Greek word is where we get our word scandal from, or to be scandalized. It means uh, to cause someone to stumble, and it means to cause someone to take offense at. So he says, they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness as, as a lifestyle. The, it's a present participle, as this is our nature, is they, they commit lawlessness uh, with impunity and they think they're getting away with it. And the angels will throw them into the furnace of fire in that place. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then, verse 43, the righteous will shine forth as the sun. This is a direct quotation uh, from Daniel chapter 7, verses 14 and uh, 27. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He, I'm sorry, that was, uh, he was, Jesus was quoting Daniel 12, verses 12, 2 through 3. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. And so now we see that the kingdom of God is the kingdom of Jesus, and it's also the kingdom of their father. And then he ends with what is, in one sense, a cryptic statement. In another sense, a very sober statement, he who has ears, let him hear. Let him hear, uh, hear is, is in the present tense, and it's a command. So Jesus is really, with his teaching, commanding us to hear and keep on hearing as a lifestyle, certainly uh, believers. Well, now, let me go in and start to explain this. 
Um, first of all, in the area of Bible study, it is very, very important when we go, when we leave a passage and go into a new passage, that we not forget the passage that we're just leaving because the two are, are inevitably, inextricably connected. That's important to keep in mind when we're seeking to learn to grow in principles of Bible study. There's also a very good reason that Jesus gave this parable right on the heels, that is the parable of the wheat and the tares, right on the heels of the parable of the sower. Uh, there's a significant contrast between the two parables and even uh, between the parable of the wheat and the tares and the mustard seed and the, um, the um, yeast or the leaven. I've already mentioned the the nature of 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 those parables as indicating uh, explosive growth of the kingdom, but then Jesus seems to thoroughly confound the disciples' thinking and expectation with this parable on the wheat and the tares. I would have been shocked as well, and that's why the disciples, when the crowds went away, they demanded that Jesus teach them and explain to them the meaning of that parable. Um, and that is, they were just sho so shocked that Jesus, in their minds, they might have even thought he was contradicting himself. Given that the kingdom of God would experience explosive growth, shouldn't that finally mean the end of Satan and the wicked? You see, that's the, the problem of the wicked and why God allows the wicked to continue to live and seemingly doesn't judge them is, is an ongoing problem that you can read about throughout the Old Testament, especially in the Psalms and, and even more especially in Psalm 37, which I think very likely could be the Old Testament background uh, to the parable of the wheat and the chairs. I really urge you to read Psalm 37 which promises a day is coming when the wicked will be dealt with. Uh, but David, who is writing Psalm 37, is, is also crying out to God and wanting to know why, apparently, he doesn't judge the wicked. So they, they were astounded that this parable teaches that the wicked are not going to be judged in this age. And... The disciples expected that to happen. The disciples expected the fullness of the kingdom of God, which is the reign of God, in, in the earth to be imminent. They expected the fullness of the kingdom of God to come in within their lifetimes. And this expectation was current throughout their three and a half years with Jesus. And even after his resurrection and his ascension. In Acts 1 6, what was the question that they asked him just before his ascension? He they they asked him, Is it at this time that you are going, going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Well, they they were men well versed in the Old Testament. They knew the exp, the messianic expectation and the messianic prophecies of how he would rule from Jerusalem and and, and Israel would be uh, the leader of all the nations. However, what Jesus is about to show them is that he, he's about to show them the nature of the kingdom of God in this present age. It's already, but it's not yet. That is, it's already arrived, but it has not yet come in its fullness. That awaits his return. And that's something that the disciples had to understand. And so Jesus, through the parable of the wheat and the tares, is showing his disciples that the full reign of the kingdom is not imminent. And in fact, the wicked, wicked would even triumph in many, many ways as they have even from the beginning. Right in the, in the garden when Cain killed his brother Abel. But again, they want to know why God would allow this. You probably also want to know 
Lord, why do you allow the wicked to get away with so much? When are you going to judge them? Let me give you one, one more introductory point, um, kind of a background of the parable. And that is the disciples did not have the advantage that we have in the completed New Testament and about 2,000 years of church history at our disposal to understand what would happen in the world after Jesus' resurrection and ascension. And so for the disciples to hear this parable that we're about to study even more, even more in depth, it just must have been, um, it must have just riddled their mind. And, um, but we'll glean more of that insight uh, from the text shortly. So, most, we don't, we're not familiar with, with um, tares, and most of us are not farmers living in the land of Israel. So I think it's important just to hit a few highlights of, you know, their technical historical points about uh, tares. Um, one thing that should be mentioned, one commentary that I quote in my notes, which you can get on the website, uh, Robert Mounts notes that usually after the grain had been cut with a sickle and removed, the remaining weeds and shorter stalks would be burned off. And that's because in the land of Israel where wood was scarce, certain weeds would be cut and bundled together to be used for fuel, for fuel. Jesus refers to that uh, in the parable. The grain then was normally stored underground in large pottery jars uh, or in pits lined with brick. In addition, this weed, the tares, was a member of the grass family and it resembled wheat-like grass, which contains a poisonous fungus and grows exclusively in grain fields in the Middle East. So there's the historical accuracy of the Bible, and it's that's the case throughout. Another of my favorite commentators, R.T. France, adds this, and this is paragraph number seven uh, in the notes, if you're following along in the notes. He writes, the weeds are probably something called darnel, a poisonous plant related to wheat and virtually indistinguishable from it until the ears form. To sow Darnell, watch this, to sow Darnell among wheat uh, as an act of revenge was punishable in Roman law. And another reason why the disciples were so surprised and taken aback that this had happened. Even a light infestation of Darnell could be tackled by careful weeding, but even then mistakes could be made. But in the case of a heavy infestation, the stronger roots of the darnel would be tangled with those of the wheat, making selective weeding impossible, and the landowner knew that. I find this fascinating because in my last ministry trip to Kenya, which is just a few weeks ago, I finished uh, preaching at a church and we were driving away uh, through a kind of a country road and we were passing through some cornfields and I happened to notice these beautiful purple flowers, like a plant but flowers, at the base of all these corn stalks in, in a cornfield. And I'm, I'm even surprised at myself for that, that I even asked the question to the pastor and a few other people riding in the car. I said, hey, those flowers are really beautiful. And they were just all over the cornfield. I said, uh, what are they? And they laughed. And they said, those flowers that look so beautiful are actually poisonous. And they should have been rooted out from the corn stalks because they can ruin the corn. And they explained to me why that hadn't been done yet. And uh, I, I don't remember the explanation, but I do find it interesting in the timing or providence of God that I actually was about to teach on this very parable, which I did 
Uh, I didn't finish the parable entirely, which is why I'm going through it right now. Uh, but that was, that was a, I got a real kick out of that, uh, that here I was about to teach on the parable of the wheat and the tares, and I saw something very similar before uh, my own eyes. Now, also in, in this parable's historical setting, our Lord's disciples had expected their Messiah to bring in his kingdom immediately, vanquish the Romans, and have Israel as the head of the nations. That's in paragraph number 12 of your notes. I point that out because I give many verses uh, to, to reinforce the disciples' thinking. The Jewish people at that time were looking for a military Messiah. He would be a conquering hero. He would vanquish the Romans and would cause Israel to, to own their own land again and be free from their enemies. So this is the historical background of the disciples' thinking. But again, the parable is given to teach them that the nature of Jesus' present invisible kingdom, invisible kingdom, would be to outlast their lives. It would exist for a long while before he would then visibly rule the nations at his return. And as we've already learned in our study about the nature of the kingdom of God, the, the kingdom is that, and I mentioned this already, is that it is already and not yet. That is, it's already here invisibly and enjoyed by those who submit will, willingly to that reign, but it's not here in its fullness in the physical realm, but it will come. In this present age, God appeals to the nations. He appeals to the nations through the offer of his gospel. He will not force people into his, into his kingdom. He will not force men to submit to his will. He will not force people to receive forgiveness of sins through his son. He won't do it. Indeed, this is one of a vast number of differences between the Christian faith and the Islamic faith. And one more reason for all Christians to understand that Allah and the God of the Bible have absolutely nothing in common. The Quran justifies uh, forcing people uh, to, to submit to Islam, at, at, whether through exorbitant taxes or even with death, that could happen. The Quran permits that. So there is absolutely nothing in common between Allah and the God of the Bible. And to say that there is, is an absolute affront to the God of Scripture. Islam is a false religion, and its prophet is a false prophet. And I say this because everything that the Quran stands for and teaches is diametrically opposed to Jesus' life and teachings. Only Jesus can offer eternal life. In the meantime, the disciples must be made to understand that while the kingdom will flourish, and, and we see that in the parable of the sower and uh, the parable of the, I keep forgetting what it's called, the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the yeast, the disciples must be made to understand that while the kingdom will flourish, not all men will be part of that kingdom due to their own choice. And again, how utterly astonished and shocked the disciples must have been. So, loved ones, this would be Jesus' explanation of why it would be that not all people would respond to him despite him being the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Moreover, in rebelling against Jesus and his authority, the wicked would actually bring deception. That is, through different religions. They would bring confusion and lies, especially about God. You see that all over in our culture. One prime example would be the teaching of evolution. 
um, and then the downplaying or the denigrating of um, creationism. And so the wicked would, would bring about uh, deception. They would bring about confusion and lies, and they would bring destruction in the earth by flaunting, watch this, their obligation for responsible free will. Remember, all people, all people have been created in God's image and after his likeness in the moral sense. And therefore, they are required to do what is right in his sight, what is good and right in his sight. They've been given, we have been given free will to obey him and do good or to disobey him and bring evil. However, when men and women and even children disobey God and his word and his standards, then they fall prey to the evil one to do his will, which is why there is an utter sense of urgency for people to get right with God ASAP, and that includes the youngest children. The gift of free will to man is astonishing in its power and influence to bring blessing to the world or to bring evil to the world. And hence, when evil triumphs and then people blame God for it, they only reveal their vast ignorance of the God of Scripture, of His nature, and of mankind's urgent responsibility to obey Him and to do what is right with their free will. So death and destruction are man's problem, and they point him to his desperate need for a Savior. So with that, let's return to our text in Matthew uh, chapter 13. Remember in verse 24, um, he said that the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. And then Jesus himself gives, gives the explanation of the parable and he defines the field uh, in verse 38. The field is the world. It is decidedly not the church. And the reason why I emphasize that is that many commentators have written that in the past, that the field is the church, and that is not the case. Jesus' plain teaching is that it is throughout the earth. The preaching of the Word of God goes out not just in the church, it goes out everywhere, in, in the schools and businesses and homes and in the printed word on television and radio today. And so the, the, the preaching of the word is not limited to the four walls of the church. And yet still commentators and teachers get it wrong. And in doing, they actually change the meaning of the entire parable. You see, the church is part of the kingdom, but it does not equal the kingdom. Again, the, the kingdom of God is greater than the church. It's bigger than the church. The kingdom of God is God's reign or rule in every sphere of society, whether people um, submit to that reign and rule or not. And so God is reigning over politics. Romans tells us that uh, no, no, no one can become the leader of, a na of the nation without God allowing it. God rules in business. God rules in the arts and sciences. God rules in education. He rules in every area of life. And he has a will. And if men and women will abide by that will and seek him for his will, then we would experience peace and righteousness and order rather than the lawlessness and the chaos that we see in so much of our world today. The church is part of the kingdom and the church expands the kingdom, but it does not equal the kingdom. And while it's true that many who claim to be Christian and who might even appear to be Christian or not, only the Lord himself can judge. 
And so accordingly, this parable, this is not a parable, a parable about the wheat and the tares growing up in the church, but rather one concerning the growth of the kingdom in the world. That's what this is all about. And many of those in the world eventually becoming part of our Lord's kingdom. That's happening all around us, right? There are uh, men and women who are, are not born again, and Romans tells us that, uh, that they are enemies of God, and they are children of wrath. That's what Ephesians tells us. That's what I was at one point. Um, I was dead in my trespasses and sins. I was rebellious against God. I was an enemy of God, but by his grace and mercy, he took me from, from being subservient to the devil, and not that I was into the occult, and then through Jesus Christ, through salvation in Jesus Christ, made me his own. That's happening all over the world. The, the sons of the devil are becoming sons of God through the preaching of the gospel. And that is one of the reasons why Jesus says, allow the tares to grow up together with the wheat. And at the harvest, at the end of the age, that's when he'll make the separation. The other thing I want to point out about um, principles of interpretation specifically with the parables, is that this is not an allegorical interpretation. That is, the meaning that Jesus gives to this parable is not allegorical. Allegorical means finding a, a hidden spiritual meaning in the different words in, in a particular narrative. The parables are actually not allegories. And so for us to try to find our own hidden spiritual meaning in parables is, is out of bounds. It is, if you try to do that, you are going to go astray. You're, you're going to misinterpret the parables. If you teach the parables, you're going to teach them incorrectly. And so it's imperative, loved ones, that we allow Jesus to give us the interpretation as he does in this parable. So sound exegesis is is an extremely patient, careful, and studied verse-by-verse -verse interpretation in context, in its literary, cultural, and historical milieu. Milieu, that's a hard word to say. Context. In Jesus' own interpretation, which we read in verses 36 to 43, none of the details, not one, is allegorical. So we don't have any liberty to try and come up with some unique, special revelation from God um, as to what this particular word means. Please um, resist the temptation to do that. It's imperative for us to instead be satisfied to allow Jesus to explain any details in the other parables, but also to recognize that this is actually something which he does not always do for us. Nevertheless, what he does want us to know is readily apparent. And so then it's our responsibility to understand rules of interpretation, um, rules and biblical principles of sound interpretation. For example, we should not read into the fact of the sower's men sleeping any irresponsibility on their part. Jesus doesn't, doesn't fault them for sleeping. Presumably, they've been sowing all day. They're exhausted, and of course they're sleeping. That's, that's a natural thing. On the contrary, the, the whole point of Jesus in mentioning that they're sleeping is that the enemy comes and does his work at night. We see that throughout Scripture. So there's no irresponsibility on their part, again, since sleeping is a necessary and normal part of life. That's important for us to understand. 
And, and to read into that something else would be reading into the parable something that just is not there. Again, Jesus never blames those men for any irresponsibility on their part whatsoever. So the fact that, that the enemy did this while they were sleeping at night, no wonder that the, the servants were absolutely um, indignant and wanted to uproot those tares. We can appreciate that. Um, then, of course, Jesus tells us in verse 38 that the tares are the sons of the evil one and that the one who sowed them is the devil in verse 39. So let me ask you this question. Doesn't this parable then explain why there is so much evil in the world? This parable is, is phenomenal. It's essential. It's outstanding to help us to understand in the New Testament age that why God allows evil to grow up, evil people to grow up with the righteous. And he does judge them in this age, but not fully and finally. And so Jesus is giving us this parable to help us to understand that. Again, I want to urge you to go back to Psalm 37 and look at an Old Testament account of why God allows uh, evil throughout this age. So I want to ask you another question. Doesn't this parable then also explain man's utter need to respond quickly and entirely to the gospel. You know, when I when I gave my life to Jesus Christ at the age of, of 20 or 21, God saved me from a lifetime of self-destruction, of of doing things that that I would have regretted. I mean I, I don't know what I would have done or what I would not have done. But I also know that in, in coming to faith in Jesus, God saved me from a lot of destruction and instead helped me to do what is good and right in his kingdom. So another question is, doesn't this parable, parable then also explain much of what goes wrong in our churches? That's the question that so many of us, I'd say virtually every Christian has, is why there why God seems to allow seems to allow so much heartache in his church so much um, strife so much sorrow so much scandal uh, churches that split uh, pastors that fall or elders and other leaders in the church who uh, behave in a very ungodly, manner. We want to know. We really, really, the reality is we expect our churches to be perfect. Now, none of us would ever say that. But, but in our hearts, that's really what we're conveying when we get upset, when we, when we get angry. And when some Christians are so offended, they, they just stop going to the church, going, they stop being part of the church. I don't like to use the term going to church. We're a part of the church. We go to a, a Sunday celebration service. Well, so clearly this parable, loved ones, gives us an insight into Satan's activity to thwart the advancement of the kingdom of God and the health of the church, which is part of that kingdom. And of course, the church is the main uh, engine of the kingdom of God, if you will, that causes the, the kingdom to grow through the preaching of the word of God and the living out righteously of the word of God. So if the devil can bring down the church, then he can cripple the advancement of the kingdom of God in this age. And that's exactly what he wants to do. So Jesus gave this parable to show his disciples that Satan will consistently oppose the growth of the kingdom, working ever so craftily to hinder, to hinder the explosive growth in the lives of individuals 
who also make up the church. And that's our Lord's connection between the two parables. Likewise, we as believers learn from Jesus that the church, again, part of and essential to the kingdom, but the church does not equal the kingdom. We learn from Jesus that the church is in an age long struggle and that true believers are not always at fault for what goes wrong in the church. I've seen a lot of heartache in the church. I've experienced a lot of heartache in the church. And men who purport to be godly men can do some pretty corruptible, damnable, horrible, rotten things. And when they do that, it can bring great destruction and great pain to the church. I've experienced that even recently. Again, let us know Jesus' words in verse 28, an enemy has done this. And then in verse 39, he tells us plainly that the enemy is the devil. So this is an extremely important matter for all Christians to keep in mind, since we ourselves have complaints about the church or will have complaints about the church and others believers and non-believers will also have complaints with the church they will find fault with the church they'll criticize the church and the reality is that even the best of us even when we're walking with the lord still fall short you know one great example of of um, scandals in the church is the ongoing scandal and dealings of Roman Catholic priests. It's died down somewhat uh, recently, but in the not too distant past, it seemed like every other day uh, it was coming out in the news of a priest who had molested usually some boys when they were young. And clearly those, those priests, I mean, they're not molesting girls, they're homosexuals and they're molesting innocent boys and the church leadership in many cases knew about this and didn't do anything about that. Now I don't know, only God knows whether these men are right with him or not, but certainly some of them were not born again even though they were church leaders. The same thing happens in Protestant and evangelical churches as well. Protestants and evangelicals are not immune from that kind of wickedness. But when it happens and it gets out into the news and it gets out into the world, what happens to people in the world? They become hard-hearted against the gospel. They become cynical against the gospel. What do they say? Oh, you know, the church, they're just full of what? You know, hypocrites, right? They say that. So they broad brush every Christian just because of the failure of relatively uh, small amount of leaders. So you see that these kind of things plays right into the hands of the devil. And that's what he is trying to do. He is trying, he is doing everything he can to prevent the successful sowing of the gospel seed in the world so that people come to faith in Jesus and so that the kingdom of God is advanced through the proclamation of of the word of god this the extremely difficult issue for non-believers uh, to understand with the above example i've already mentioned is that the minister may not even be saved and if that's the case loved ones deception has been in operation and where deception is successful satan's fingerprints may be found. You can be sure of it. Well, I am running out of time. Unfortunately, this has been um, part one of the parable of the wheat and the tares. And so uh, we'll pick up in part two in our next video broadcast. But for now, let me stop and pray. And let's just commit this time to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we pray that you, you would help us to bear great fruit as we are faithful to study your word, to hear it with faith, to get it deeply into our hearts and to live it out. Help us, Father, to uh, 
uh, bear good fruit and great fruit for your namesake, for your church, and for your kingdom. And use us mightily, those of us who know you, use us mightily to reach other people uh, for Jesus Christ, we ask in his name. Amen and amen. I want to mention to you that uh, that I make my living uh, by the gospel, and I have, um, I'm not ashamed to say I've worked extremely hard on this teaching, and if the Lord uh, leads you to desire to contribute to my ongoing ministry, both here in the United States and in Kenya, and soon in other places of Africa, um, please give your best. Uh, maybe it's even a sacrificial gift. But you can go to my website, pastorbradabley.weebly.com, and you'll find the giving instructions uh, through a ministry that I'm part of, Empowered Living International Ministries. And so again, if you would like to write a check out, you've got information on, on how to go about doing that. Or if you want to give online, you can do that as well. Just go to my website. And um, if you just need to Google it, just type in P Pastor Brad Abley and uh, look for Empowered Living International Ministries and just follow the instructions and in giving there. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom, both now and forevermore in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Amen.